Dr. Michael Hollick is Professor of Medicine, Physiology, and Biophysics, Director of the General Clinic Research Unit, Director of the Bone Healthcare Clinic, and the Director of the Heliotherapy, Light, and Skin Research Center at Boston University Medical Center. After earning a PhD in biochemistry, a medical degree, and completing a research postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Hollett completed a residency in medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. As a graduate student, he was the first to identify the major circulating form of vitamin D in human blood as 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. He then isolated and identified the active form of vitamin D as 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3. He determined the mechanism for how vitamin D is synthesized in the skin and demonstrated the effects of aging, obesity, latitude, seasonal change, sunscreen use, skin pigmentation, and clothing on this vital cutaneous process. Dr. Hollick has served as, as the chair for the Endocrine Society's practice guidelines on vitamin D. He has authored more than 400 peer-reviewed publications and written more than 200 review articles, as well as numerous book chapters, and he has been the recipient of numerous awards and honors. Welcome, Dr. Hollick. Pleasure um, to have this opportunity to share with you my thoughts about um, the delightfully controversial vitamin D and its health benefits from inception until death and the 200, 2022 perspective. People worry about conflict of interest. And so I receive support from a variety of um, companies um, as a consultant and other activities. And I also get support from the Sun. And you can go to this website to get more information, at least about what I've been talking about, vitamin D. Now, what am I going to tell you that you don't already know about vitamin D in terms of the IOM report, the vital study, 2024 guidelines? So 2010, the IOM came out with recommendations. And in my opinion, they were quite remarkable because before 2010, the RDA was 200 units and they suggested up to 600 units was fine. And more importantly, they appreciated that 2000 units was considered to be the upper limit. Now you could at least take 4000 units a day. The IOM guidelines, however, was not intended for physicians, right? It was up to professional associations to make these recommendations and they used a population model not a medical model. In 2011, the Endocrine Society uh, reported guidelines on vitamin D, and I was fortunate enough to chair this committee, and all the members of the committee are experts in the field of vitamin D, and as you can see, Dr. Heaney was a member as well. And the objective was clear for the prevention of vitamin D deficiency with emphasis on care of patients who were at risk of vitamin D deficiency. So 2011, the recommendation for infants up to one year of age, 400 to 1,000 units a day. Children, 600 to 1,000 units a day. And adults, 1,500 to 2,000 units a day. And if you're obese, you need two to three times more. Endocrine Society guidelines for 2024. Overt vitamin D deficiency, they recognize, can cause rickets and osteomalacia. In population observations, lower 25-hydroxy D concentrations are associated with a higher risk of undesirable outcomes, fractures, infections, cardiovascular disease, cancer, and mortality. Whether vitamin D supplementation reduces these risks uh, is, remains unclear. A priori decisions made by the 2024 guidelines focus generally on healthy populations. Assume that the RDA by the IOM was in fact correct. And so 600 units up to 70 years of age, and that includes pregnancy, 800 units when you're 70 years and older. Since observational studies are susceptible to bias and confounding the panel, focused mainly on RCTs, whenever possible, focused on patient important outcomes rather than other outcomes, including association studies. So they recommended, they didn't recommend any vitamin D supplementation for infants. One to 18 years of age, 600 units, 18 to 75, 600 units. And if you're obese, they don't recommend any 
different change. And for 75 years and older, if you want to live a bit longer, they suggested 900 units a day. But did they get it right? Right here are the guidelines. They depended on randomized controlled trials, ignored association studies. And so I think that Ignaz Semmelweis would be even back then had appreciated that that's a bad idea. And so here's recommendation eight from the 2024 guidelines. We suggest empiric vitamin D supplementation during pregnancy, given its potential risk for lowering preeclampsia, interuterine mortality, preterm birth, small gestation for age, and neonatal mortality. And they recommended on average 2,500 units a day. Wow, that's amazing to think about this, that they actually recognize non-skeletal health benefits of vitamin D. So what about pregnancy? Are pregnant women at risk if they're taking a prenatal vitamin? And so we did a study at our hospital and we documented very carefully them taking a prenatal vitamin and drinking milk. They were drinking 600 units a day from diet and from supplement. That's the amount recommended by the Institute of Medicine and now the 2024 guidelines. And we showed 76% of moms, 81% of newborns were less than 20 nanograms per ml. They were vitamin D division. Why should you care? Because we went on to show with Lisa Bodner many years ago, preeclampsia is associated with vitamin D deficiency. We also demonstrated that vitamin D, critically important for muscle function and birthing, that if you were vitamin D deficient, you had a much higher risk of requiring a C-section. Could you have been delivered later if mom had taken vitamin D? And a very nice study demonstrated gestational age and 25-hydroxy vitamin D, remarkable 60% reduction in premature births if the blood level is greater than 40 nanograms per ml. Mom, thanks for taking your vitamin D. Prenatal vitamin D and dental caries, inverse relationship with the amount of decay in infants with higher 25-hydroxy vitamin D during pregnancy. But recommendation eight, we suggest empiric vitamin D supplementation during pregnancy, right? There it is. But yet, they say, a priori decisions, general approach, including pregnancy, they recommend 600 units of vitamin D a day. There's a disconnect because here on one hand, they recognize the non-skeletal health benefit during pregnancy, but yet they don't recommend that all pregnant women should increase their vitamin D intake. How do you define vitamin D deficiency, right? You wanna measure your 25 hydroxy vitamin D and anything lower than 20, we consider definitely to impact on bone health. But people worry about, is it high, is it normal, or is it low? And so for those that are high, Baywatch babes, right? They're 110, right? Lifeguards, are they intoxicated? I don't think so. You don't have to worry about intoxication until you're over 150 nanograms per ml. But the lower limit, how do you know if you're vitamin D deficient? Do you really need to be greater than 30? So we did a study with Anne DePap many years ago and showed PTH levels continue to decline until you get to around 30 nanograms per ml. You have a three times higher risk of having secondary hyperparathyroidism if your level is 21 compared to greater than 30 nanograms per ml. We also asked another question about sunlight and, and the variability in your PTH and 25-hydroxy-D, 3.8 million samples and showed as expected, your peak blood levels are at the summer and nadir is at the end of winter. And your PTH levels begin to increase and maximize four weeks later. And the real question is, the levels are at around 29 nanograms per ml at the end of the summer, compared to around 18 to 20 nanograms in the winter. There's no question that when you're vitamin D deficient, less than 30, that your PTH levels will um, continue to rise at the lower levels. We also know something else, which is a study done in 2010 by Primmel looked at 675 German motor vehicle accident victims and got blood for 25-hydroxy-D and bone and showed, here's normal bone, 
Here is osteoporotic bone where you see no trabeculae, but here you see normal trabeculae and pink stuff. That's osteoid. That's classic for vitamin D deficiency rickets. And here in healthy German adults, ages 20 to 90 years of age, almost 27% and 37% had evidence of osteoid, um, osteomalacia or uh, osteoidosis, which is osteoid buried within your bone. And they concluded, the IOM, that if you take this number of those between 21 and 29 having osteomalacia over the total as a denominator, less than 1% had osteomalacia. So they concluded you only need to be 20 nanograms per ml. But Primmel said you needed to be greater than 30. And in fact, they made a high school error in, in judgment, right? You should be taking this as your numerator and this is your dominator, meaning that adults with a 25-hydroxy-D of 21 to 29 nanograms per ml, 22% had osteomalacia, right? And so this is the preferred range that you've already heard from Jen, is what the Endocrine Society recommended in 2011. Does vitamin D reduce risk of fractures? Well, now the vital study came out, right? And oh my gracious, now it's suggested that people should stop taking vitamin D supplementation to extend life or have any major impact on your health. So over 25,000, right, separated into what's called a placebo group and a group getting 2,000 units of vitamin D a day. The problem with the study is many fold. One of them is they're, they're permitted to, for the placebo group to take at least 800 units a day. But if they take a multivitamin containing 800 units a day, they could be taking up to 1,200 units a day. Look at this. Baseline 25-hydroxy-D in this whole group was 30 nanograms per ml. 64.7% had a 25-hydroxy-D of at least 30. What percent were less than 20? Shockingly, only about 12.9%. Um, Indeed, this study showed very clearly that only those that were severely vitamin D deficient, but 2.4%, a very small number, they couldn't really make any sense out of whether or not there was any impact on osteoporosis. They made it clear that this study was not uh, um, to be associated um, and reflective of vitamin D deficiency for low bone mass or osteoporosis. It was not a placebo-controlled trial. Therefore, 87.1% were considered sufficient, greater than 20 nanograms per ml. Recommendation, children and adolescents should think about taking empiric vitamin D supplementation because the clinical trial suggested that it may help reduce risk of respiratory tract infections, 1,200 units of vitamin D a day. Now, what about for COVID, right? And what about for adults? What about all of the data that's out there regarding infectious diseases in adults? We know vitamin D plays a critical role in innate and adaptive immunity. We know that these are nice theories, but what about the data? And it turns out that we did a study in over 190,000 patients during early COVID and showed if you're vitamin D deficient, you have a 54% higher risk of acquiring COVID infection. Study done in San Francisco showed very nicely hospitalization that you markedly decrease risk of hospitalization by 22% and mortality by 44, 45%. We did a study at our hospital and showed if your vitamin D is sufficient, overall odds reduction of death, 82%, right? But the general population, the recommendation for younger and aged in 50 years, we suggest against empiric vitamin D supplementation. Those over, we suggest against routine 25-hydroxy-D testing. beta iowa cells have a vitamin D receptor. We know that 125D regulates insulin production. Pitas showed many years ago a clear association with increased risk of type 2 diabetes, relative risk reduction 33%. Another study that was done showed that meta-analysis, type 2 diabetes, broad range of blood levels in diverse populations, significant association. For adults with high-risk prediabetes, 
The 2024 guidelines recommends that you should take empiric vitamin D. And they suggest it on average about maybe 3,500 units a day. Recommendation two, though, the general population, younger than 50, they don't recommend empiric vitamin D supplementation. So how do you know if you're going to get prediabetes or not? Right, One third of the population has type 2 diabetes. Right, The general population, again, no testing for 25-hydroxy D. Can you live longer? Right? Here's a very nice study by Cedric Garland several years ago. Again, maximum benefit and reduced risk of mortality, 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. And so, yes, the 2024 guidelines suggested empiric um, supplementation, but only about 900 uh, units of vitamin D. And yet the normal recommendation is 800 units. But the real issue is, it's silly, in my opinion, to be worried about mortality at the age of 75 and taking more vitamin D. The vitamin D effect reduces risk of cardiovascular disease, cancer mortality, et cetera. And that's earlier in life. And so as a result, the general population of 75 years of age, an increase in vitamin D may improve their mortality, but you care about improving mortality by maintaining vitamin D from birth until death. And again, just looking at vitamin D deficiency and disease of neglect, right? It's necessary, right? A mountain of evidence looking into these chronic illnesses and thinking about all the different types of disease burdens associated. Don't think about a normal level, but a healthy level. You want to be at least 30 nanograms per ml. And here's a good example of here, Masai Herders, 40 to 50 nanograms per ml, right? You would have to take 4,000 to 5,000 units a day. Goal, 30, preferably 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, right? So poor Ignaz, right? Here he is. He has a stamp and a gold coin. He even has a medical school in his name. He instituted hand washing back in the 1840s. He thought that this was a great idea, but his thought leaders thought it was bad humors in the air and it was a bad idea. And so he even demonstrated an association study. Thought leaders, women and babies are dying. And if you wash your hands, essentially no one dies. What did they do? They were so angry with him, they said he was crazy. They committed him to an insane asylum. They had the um, uh, guards beat him up, and he died two weeks later of infectious disease. Vitamin D deficiency is the most common medical condition. Any one of these chronic illnesses turn out to be associated, right? Even Dr. Joanne Manson says, 2,000 units a day, safe for many years, right? Many benefits. But if you have a higher BMI, maybe not. And so we do need to look more carefully at the effect of um, obesity. So you want to reduce risk of various disorders, association and other studies, 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, preeclampsia, more than 50%, preterm birth, 62%, autoimmune disorders, 39%, Metastatic and fatal cancers, 38%. Type 1 diabetes, 81%, 88%. And advanced type 2 diabetes, 76%. And peripheral vascular disease by 80%. Respiratory tract infections, 58%. Vitamin D can improve your health. No question about it. And I thank you for your kind attention.